Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Worship in Spirit and Truth. Now at this particular point I want to recap a little bit for you and talk about the things that we've covered so far. I've spent quite a lot of time in recent programs talking about the Old Testament. We do that in all of the Sword of the Spirit topics because you see the Old Testament is always the foundation for the New Testament. And so there are many principles that we can learn about worship in the Old Testament. But we must also understand that when Jesus came, so much changed because Jesus is the fulfillment of so many of those Old Testament images and pictures and types of things that are revealed there. For example, we saw in the Old Testament that God required his people to gather at a certain place. They were to worship God in the temple in Jerusalem. And it was almost as if that that was the most important place of worship. Many religions today still point out to certain places of worship and say it's important to go here or to go there. But the revolution of Jesus as he spoke to the woman of Samaria where that statement is found that God is looking for those who worship him in spirit and truth. There Jesus said this, the time is coming and now is when we won't have to say go to Jerusalem to worship God or to worship here or to worship there because the true worshippers of God would worship him in spirit and truth. And what that means is this, is that the Old Testament principles concerning worship in the temple, that temple was built in Jerusalem, that holy place that was set apart by God for his Old Testament people, that all that now is fulfilled in Christ. You see, Jesus is the temple of the Lord because when Christ came into the world, he was carrying the very presence of God with him for he was and is God manifested in the flesh. We also see that in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul develops this teaching further and says that as God's Spirit dwells in each and every one of our hearts as believers in Jesus Christ, we are also the temples of God. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That means that you can draw near to God in the name of Jesus and worship Him absolutely anywhere in the world, at any time, at any moment. You don't have to go to a certain place to perform a, an act of worship to be more holy than if you'd stayed at home. No, it's about drawing near to God through faith in Christ wherever you are. We've also seen that there were certain seasons and festivals in the Old Testament where God said, worship me in this way at this particular time. And the, this particular festival was to point to some revelation of God. All those revelations were powerful and wonderful in their time and in their place. But when we worship God in the name of Jesus Christ, there is no one time that is more right to worship him than any other time. Every moment of our day, we are worshiping God. That's why the New Testament revelation concerning worship is that worship covers the whole of life and every activity of life. Even when we're at work or at school or college, it's an act of worship to God because we are doing all things to the honor and to the glory of his name. So that's why I like to look into the Old Testament, to look at the principles of worship so that we can see how they apply to our lives today and be set free from the religious prescriptions of a bygone age and to have a living relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now in today's program we also stick with the New Old Testament but we look at the teaching of worship found in the Psalms. Hello and welcome back to the Sword of the Spirit teaching Worship in Spirit and Truth. 
We've come to the point where we're looking at the Psalms, the Psalms of the Old Testament, that worship book of the Old Testament. And there's so much to learn from the Psalms. Many Christians today use the Psalms in their worship, particularly when they see the teaching of the Psalms filtered through the cross and resurrection of Jesus and given that distinctive Christian application to our lives. Some people worship using the Psalms directly from the Old Testament because it contains so much New Testament truth and revelation for our lives. And certainly, the Psalms help us fulfill our objective in this seminar in which we're looking at the principles that undergird the worship of the people of God so that we can apply those principles to our lives that we might become worshipers in spirit and truth, just as Jesus said the Father is seeking us to become. Now, the Old Testament book of Psalms contains 150 pieces of spiritual poetry. That's what the Psalms are, spiritual poetry. And uh, these 150 Psalms are arranged into five collections or mini books. Psalms 1 to 41, Psalm 42 to 72, Psalm 30, 73 to 89, Psalm 90 to 106, and Psalm 107 to 150. Those are the five collections of Psalms. Now, at the end of each of these five collections, there is a doxology. A doxology is a formal praise uh, to God. Uh, blessed be, here we have Psalm 41 and verse 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And then the Psalm 150 seems to be a doxology for the whole book of Psalms. It'd be good to just to start to have a, a, a look at that. Um, and when we when we go through all of the Psalms and follow through this uh, particular uh, format that uh, I've, I've mentioned for you, it's good to see how it works and uh, how it, how it uh, gives you all the information you need to worship God uh, in your own worship life. Psalm 150 is a powerful psalm. It's a doxology for all of the Psalms. Praise the Lord. Praise the God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, that was a very weak and late response. Uh, most scholars think that the Psalms were assembled into these five books so they could be used in the worship of the restored temple which was built in Jerusalem by Nehemiah after the return from exile. Uh, now, there are certain Psalms which clearly must have been written at that time. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. And they said to us, sing a song of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Yes, there were psalms which obviously date to that period. And there might have been some final bringing together of these psalms uh, from that period. But it seems that most of the psalms would have been written long before the exile during the time of the kings. Which shows us how the people of God were worshipping a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. Now the five collections must have been selected from earlier and separate collections. Maybe these were brought together, different hymn books, for example, from Asaph, Korah, and David. And maybe for some song sheets that were used uh, on annual occasions, or occasions such as the annual pilgrimages to Jerusalem or the family Passover meal. Uh, the fact that some of the Psalms duplicate each other seems to prove that they were coming from different earlier parallel collections. For example, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, and many of some of these Psalms, they're, they're the same. There's duplicates there, so they're probably from earlier collections. And uh, we know that uh, the Psalms speak so much about God's name because they reveal God's name in, and his nature more fully than any of the other parts of the, of the Bible, it seems. And uh, it's possible that these five collections of psalms were probably constructed around God's name, 
For example, books 1, 4, and 5 focus almost entirely on the name Yahweh, whereas the other books 2 and 3 concentrate on Elohim. Interesting to have a look at the titles of the Psalms. In most English Bibles, nearly all the Psalms have a title. You need to know that these titles were not part of the original scripture, uh, but they were the preservation of traditional ideas about the Psalms. Some titles contain musical directions. For example, Michtam in Psalms 56 to 58 probably means to sing in a quiet voice. Other titles stipulate the tune to be used. For example, Psalm 56, the silent dove in distant lands. That's the name of the tune. 57, do not destroy. Psalm 60, lily of the testimony. These are probably the uh, names of the tunes. And then a few titles uh, describe the particular instruments that need to be played uh, when these psalms were, were performed. Some titles link the psalm with a particular person. For example, in Psalm 88, it's linked to Heman. 89 is linked to Ethan. Psalm 90 is linked to Moses. Other titles identify the type of the psalm. For example, Psalm 145 is stipulated to be a psalm of praise. Psalm 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. Psalm 89, a psalm of contemplation. Psalm 90, a psalm of prayer. Psalm 45, a love song. And so it goes on. And straight away we see the variety of these different psalms. Uh, there were psalms for, of lament and psalms of rejoicing and psalms of victory and psalms of despair and psalms of hope and psalms of repentance and psalms of forgiveness and psalms of joy and psalms of tears. And it just seems as if God has purposefully ensured that the psalms capture the full range of human emotions. And I think this is a great lesson for those singers and songwriters today who want to lead us into the song of the Lord in our generation. We have many psalms of victory, uh, hymns and songs of victory today, and some songs of praise, and wonderful that they, are, that they are. But we also need to know how to mourn and to weep and lament, and how to sing songs about the troubled periods of our lives, as well as uh, just singing all the praise and victory songs. I know everything is praise and victory in the end, but we must be real with our feelings. And I often go to the Psalms, as I'm sure you do, to express before God in words given by the Holy Spirit concerning the emotions that I'm going through. And the Psalms tell us that it really is. If they're feeling bad, they tell God they're feeling bad. He's one person who can take and handle your emotions. But of course, the, the reality of this is that the Holy Spirit lifts us up into all the other blessings that he has for us. Many of the Psalms are called Psalms of David. Now, uh, where we have uh, Psalm of David, 73 Psalms are attributed to him, or at least called a Psalm of David. Now, sometimes this could mean that the Psalm was actually written by David. At other times, it uh, means that he was, the Psalm was possibly written for David. It could occasionally mean that it was part of a collection issued by the palace. In other words, it had the royal stamp. It's just rather like today when you have um, the royal seal of approval on certain goods. Uh, it's just perhaps something like that. We know that uh, David himself was a gifted musician, poet, and psalmist. He had great interest in prophetic worship. 1 Chronicles 25, verses 1 to 8. And the point that I was making earlier in the last session about prophetic worship comes into its own here because the Psalms are prophetic. The Psalms are a declaration of the word of the Lord. They're not just the words of men which have been recorded and offered to God. They are the words of God given to men by which men may praise him, lament before him, confess their sins. The Psalms are inspired, but they are pro prophetic. And uh, in 1 Chronicles 25, it says, Moreover, David and the captains of the army separated for the service, some of the sons of separated for the service, some of the sons of Asaph, of Heman, and of Jejuthun, who could prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals, and the number of the skilled men performing their service was. 
of the sons of Asaph, and then it goes on to, to, to describe what their numbers were. And so it's sure that David wrote many of the Psalms himself. Psalm 18 is an edited version of his poem in, Psalm, in 2 Samuel 22. So it's very clear that David did uh, write many of the Psalms. We also see that many of the Psalms are linked in the title to some of the incidences in David's life. For example, in Psalm 59, we have here the uh, incident referred to, to the chief. This is in the title. Remember, the titles here are not actually uh, what is appearing in the original manuscript, but it gives a traditional link, and Jewish historians and scholars would link it to this event, to the chief musician set to do not destroy a mitcham, mitcham of David when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. Save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They prepare, they run and prepare themselves through no fault of my own. There be something really pleasing about singing a psalm like that to the Lord. And so we have all, I've listed quite a few of them here for you, incidences from the life of David that are linked to particular psalms. That in and of itself does not prove that David wrote the psalm. You need to understand that. But it's uh, very likely because it was, he was a psalmist himself. Now we have the different types of psalms that I have mentioned earlier. They express the whole range of human feelings and experiences from deep depression to ecstatic joy. You really can turn to the book of Psalms and find a psalm that's going to fit your mood, your emotion at that moment, whatever it is. Some psalms are wonderful hymns of praise to God, like the ones from 145 to 150. So if you're feeling down, go to Psalm 145 and sing all the way through to the end. doesn't matter what tune, you can, God will give you a tune. And uh, so, some songs are songs that can be sung at times of peace uh, and experiencing, when you're experiencing deep inner peace. Other psalms reflect the dark and painful moments of human experience. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, don't leave it there because the rest of the psalm goes on to say, well, he hasn't really forsaken you, has he? But that's how you feel. That's what you're expressing. Now, some psalms are for worshippers who recognize their personal guilt and faults and uh, want to come to God for repentance, like Psalm 51, which speaks about David's repentance. Other psalms are for worshippers who think that they're innocent and shouldn't be suffering at all. Uh, when we're going through a bad time, we know it's not always through our own personal sin. And so we're saying, Lord, it's just not fair what's happening. And when you're praising him in that situation and expressing your feeling, you're committing it to God. Many psalms also were psalms which enabled the whole nation to respond to God together at a time of national uncertainty or a time of national uh, disaster. And uh, we experience uh, one of those psalms, we can see one of those psalms, Psalm 44, which describes that. And uh, let me just find it for you and, and, and read some of it. And what, what I like so much about the psalms is that they express something which is so clearly individual. It's what we are going through individually. But then they also express something about our corporate life together. Here it is, Psalm 44. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, by them you planted. But them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did they, their own arms save them, but it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance because you favored them. 
You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you we'll push down our enemies. Through your name we'll trample those who rise against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Selah. But you have cast us off and put us to shame. You do not go out with our enemies. You make us turn back from the enemy, and those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves. You have given us up like sheep intended for food, and have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing, you are, and are not enriched by selling them. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those all around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. My dishonor is continually before me, and the shame of my face has covered me because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles, because of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from our way, from your way. And so the psalm goes on to lament, obviously a a big defeat in, in, uh, in battle or a downward turn in the nation's events in times of, 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 of defeat. Some psalms help people to celebrate together. Psalm 45, for example, that great psalm which is talking about a, uh, perhaps a, a, used maybe at a coronation or something like that. Here it is. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and splendor. And all of this is talking about the the glory of the the king. And then we have the description of of the king's consort. Verse 10, listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will desire, will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. And the daughter of Tyre will give a gift and rich among the people will seek your favor. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. This is a description of the, of the bride. And this is a, obviously a coronation or, or a royal wedding. Other psalms express people's gratitude to God. Now, there are psalms which plead with God and psalms which praise Him. There are appeals for forgiveness and appeals for the destruction of enemies, prayers for the king, prayers for the nation. There are psalms which probe life's problems and psalms which celebrate the greatness of God's law. Many psalms are a mixture of various themes, but they all are part of the worshipping life of God's people. So you can see straight away that our worship life is very limited. When we're feeling down or depressed, we just go away and complain. Why didn't you go away and pray? You don't feel like praying. Well, tell God what you feel like telling him. You'll be soon surprised how quickly uh, God will alter your, uh, your perspective <laughs> when you come to him. But it's not wrong to express ourselves as we feel to God. When you read the Psalms, they are honest. They are searingly honest, sometimes shockingly honest. But if we're going to use the book of Psalms correctly today in our worship, we must understand that these Psalms are a collection of inspired Hebrew poems which were meant to be used in worship. The Psalms aren't sermons to be read, nor doctrinal treatises to be discussed. They are songs to be sung. In fact, uh, most, as we said earlier, most scholars consider the Psalms to be the five-volume hymn book of the Second Temple. But many people think today that poetry is rather remote and intellectual. If I was to say I'm going to now uh, read you a poem, you'd probably think I've gone a little soft or maybe a little intellectual. But Hebrew poetry was not like that. Hebrew poetry, forgive the expression, was very gutsy, much closer to modern oratory than modern poetry. some have compared some of the repetition that the Psalms have to Winston Churchill's classic wartime speeches, which were, in, in the English language, the height of oratory in many, many ways. 
Let's take some of the Hebrew uh, forms of Hebrew poetry to show you what I mean. Let's take, first of all, a common phenomenon called parallelism. Parallelism. This is the echoing of the thought of one line in, line, uh, in a second line, which, it's, which is its partner. So it is echoing one thought in the second part of it. And so an example of parallelism is found in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. It says there, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Has he said, and will he not do? Has he, or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Can you see the repetition there? And uh, the, it's, there's, two, there's two examples of parallelism there. Now this device of repeating your th the thought a second time in slightly different words is bringing great dignity to this text. It creates an, an impression of spaciousness. It allows time for thought. It allows time for the words to have impact on the listener. And it also enables the poet to present more than one facet of a matter. For example, another example, Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8. You know that there are poetry sections written throughout all of the Old Testament. And one of the ways that you can tell is that most modern translations, when they include a poetical form, they present it differently. Sometimes the text is in italics, or the margin spacing is different, and the line spacing is different. And so that's how the translators helped us to identify uh, the poetic forms of uh, the poetic literary form underlying the text. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8 is a beautiful poetic parallelism. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful way? of expressing. So there's a thought which is duplicated, but it's not quite the same. He's using slightly different language. And you can have uh, lots of different forms of parallelism. Sometimes uh, the, the parallel is, is, is actually words which are almost identical and exactly the same thought, and sometimes it's a slight variation of the thought, but it's still parallelism. And that brings to an end today's teaching on worship in spirit and truth. And I pray that as you've been watching and listening, God has been drawing you closer and closer to himself. There's no greater thing on earth than being a worshipper of the Father in the name of Jesus. And so until next time, goodbye and God bless you.